What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of My Other Passion. I'm Ernest Baker, Editor-in-Chief for Front Office Sports, and today we have Will Ahmed, who is the CEO of Whoop, joining us. If you don't know about Whoop, it is a health monitoring company. A lot of athletes use it. Patrick Mahomes, LeBron James, and Michael Phelps were among the first to try it, and they have a long list of investors, whether institutional investors like SoftBank or folks like Kevin Kuhn. So... We had a great conversation just talking about where he's been in life, playing on the varsity squash team at Harvard, and where he sees this space going. So I want to go ahead and get right into the combo. We have to take a quick break and hear from our partners at NetSuite Oracle, and then we'll be right back. 2000, 2008, 2022, when it comes to the economy, those are some scary years. First, you got the dot-com crash and the housing crash and whatever roller coaster we're going through right now. One thing is certain, though, it's a dangerous time to not know your numbers, but over 31,000 businesses have the confidence and clarity they need because they rely on NetSuite by Oracle, the number one cloud financial system. NetSuite gives you visibility, control over your finances, inventory, HR, planning, budgeting, everything you need to manage risks and get reliable forecasts right there, right in one place. So how do you prepare for uncertain times? NetSuite. It's going to help you identify rising costs, automate business processes, and easily see where to save money so you can improve those margins. 93% of customers say they improve their visibility and control when they upgrade to NetSuite. So what are you waiting for? Right now, you're in luck because NetSuite is offering a one-of-a-kind flexible financing program. All you got to do is head to netsuite.com slash myotherpassion. Again, netsuite.com slash my other passion. Sign up, check it out, and see just how much you can improve your business. Will, welcome to the show. Ernest, thank you for having me. How are you feeling today? Good. I've got a green recovery on Whoop, so that's always good. 91%. That's what it's all about, right? Do you, you probably how how like hardcore are you about your Whoop being that you're like the CEO and all? Well, I, I certainly use the product every day and I've got the uh the longest data streak on Whoop, uh which let me see what I'm at right now. So I've been wearing it for two thousand four hundred and eighty six days straight, which is a pretty long time to be wearing anything on your body. Yeah. Uh and and uh look, I think the best lens for building a product oriented company is being obsessed with the product. So that's, that was really what pulled me into uh, building this company. Yeah. You are, are you, do you still have that $3.6 billion valuation? That's the last one that I saw and, and you all have raised like $400 million. I mean, this is, did you see things reaching this point when you started this a decade ago, back in 2012, I believe? Um, I'm sure as an entrepreneur, you always had the vision, right? But but how does it feel to to be at the helm of a company that's in this position? Look, it's exhilarating. It's humbling. It's uh, every day is a new adventure. I think the things I love most about Whoop are probably uh, the people and, and the product. You know, it's a by virtue of building wearable technology, it's hardware, it's software, it's uh, health and research, it's analytics, it's um, working with great designers and marketers. And uh, it's just, a, it's a team that's a very uh, wide skill sets. And, uh, and it's a hard driving group of people that is frankly humble too. So it's, it's been an amazing uh, team to, to get to work with every day and and truly people that have a I'd say a much deeper expertise in everything that they do than than uh than certainly I do. And then the product is, you know, it's a product that people wear 24/7 and uh changes behavior and improves health. And uh and so that's that's pretty impactful to get messages every day from Whoop members who have lost weight or, you know, figured out how to overcome stress or run their first marathon or, uh, you know, built better relationships with their family or finally learn how to sleep. Like the, the list kind of goes on. I mean, even people who the product saved their lives. So that's, I just uh, got the 4.0 by the way. And yeah, 
as much as like the the exercise and fitness component is important um i need it to help me get my sleep on track i am not a good sleeper so i love that component of it yeah i think i think that's one of the first things people jump to is the sleep and and for good reason i mean it's like this invisible third of your life if you don't measure your sleep it's really hard to know what's going on during that period and uh and the reality is there's a lot of little nuances that you can change about your lifestyle to enhance your sleep. And we're not talking about uh, profound changes in, in some cases, uh, but little shifts here and there. And then, you know, next thing you feel much better and you function much better and, and, you know, you're living a happier life. So what's it, when I ask like, what's it like? I think we have a lot of, you know, young entrepreneurs, like people, building businesses, aspiring to get to a point where you're at, what do people like not really realize perhaps about being in this position? Because you see a $3.6 billion valuation, we raised so much money. And I think there's this idea of, in some ways, you know, I made it. And, and I think you probably have had those moments of feeling like, wow, I really built this and we're a billion dollar company and cool. Um, but I know from either being adjacent to people in your position or talking to people who've built companies before, even at front office sports, you know, I've been here like two years now looking at our trajectory, that point that you think or thought was going to be like the mountaintop usually is like just an inflection point, just a, we have so much more to do. So I want to hear from you though, because like, once you start getting into the billions, how do you stay hungry? How do you not get complacent? And how do you like keep a company going after you hit goals that, you know, probably seem so far off at one point in time? Well, you're touching on an amazing uh, phenomenon, like a really important phenomenon uh, for all entrepreneurs. And it's this idea that most entrepreneurs, and I was guilty of this, operate on this like dopamine system, which is to say that you tell yourself, okay, when the company gets to this level, that's going to be the moment, right? And, you know, the way a dopamine system works is by assigning a lot of value to something, it actually can be very motivating to get there, right? If I told you, Ernest, hey, we're going to the best restaurant in your entire life tonight, it is the very best food you've ever had in your entire life. You've never had a better bite anywhere. You know, chances are you're going to get to that restaurant tonight, right? Like it's motivating to feel that dopamine and in turn, you're actually creating dopamine. The problem with uh, a dopamine system is that it um, you're, you've often completely overweighted the destination or the value of that destination. And when you get there, there's this huge letdown. And what do you do? Oh, you say, well, I, I just had the wrong destination in mind. It's not 250 million, it's a billion. It's not a billion, it's 3 billion. You know, like, and uh, it, the key is um, not to run exclusively on a dopamine system as a mechanism for, uh, for happiness or drive. Uh, the, the, the piece that, I developed over time was also incorporating uh, gratitude. And you can be grateful for what you've built while also hard charging to get to the next level. And that's a balance for whatever reason that uh, many people have trouble finding. And I certainly had a lot of trouble finding, uh, but it makes you much happier. And th there's this uh, misperception, I think, that if you are too grateful for, you know, the moment that you're at or what you've accomplished or the team you've assembled, if you're too grateful about that, it's going to somehow make you complacent and you're not going to be hard charging. Complacency and gratitude are very different things. And in, in fact, gratitude creates a serotonin, right? So we talked about dopamine and talk about serotonin. Those are two things that make your brain I'm happy and, and, and functioning. So, uh, for me, uh, you know, over the course of building this company, it's been, um, it's been 
really trying to to develop a sense for gratitude of what I've been able to create. And, you know, when I read a message from a Whoop member and it's like, hey, you know, this product changed my life. Thank you. It's not just like jumping on to the next thing. It's like absorbing it for a second. You know what I mean? And really feeling that kind of stuff. Uh, even in even in the challenges, like when you're dealing with um, a lot of, of really hard things that are happening in your company. And by the way, as your organization gets bigger, those problems harder. amplify, right? And complexity amplifies, right? And so, um, you know, often I find myself in the center of a storm, it feels like. But the thing that I try to remind myself is I'm at the center of the right storm. Like I'm in the right place. Like this is what I, what I want to be doing. This is a mission that I believe in. Um, and again, there's a set, there's a sort of a subtle framework there too, where it's not just about wins that make you happy and losses that make you sad. It's about how are you managing the day to day? You, the individual, not you CEO of multi-billion dollar company that needs to now be worth $10 billion. No, you, the individual who's dealing with the highs and the lows, are you getting a little better every day? And so that's that's the piece that I I try to focus on as well. I've always seen and appreciate that saying that's like, you know, I think it's intended for people in a moment of chaos or stress. Just remember at one point you were wishing for everything that you have now. And it puts a lot of things into perspective. I also think it's really cool how, you know, just with the answers you had then, um, and obviously your business is built on this, but like physiology is, you know, I'm asking you, how do you manage uh, stuff with your business? And you're like, well, this is what the dopamine cycle, this is the serotonin. I mean, physiology is, is super interesting. And, and I think why people and a lot of people have fallen in love with whoop is just with wearables in general. One of the coolest things that I saw related to your company um, Patrick Mahomes, who obviously you work closely with in some capacity, I believe it was a Super Bowl or it may have just been like some big game, but essentially like you all showed his heart rate through everything. And at one of the most crucial, difficult points of the game, I think it's like down to the wire. He had the lowest heart rate. It actually went viral on our social because people are like, this is what they mean by ice in your veins. He was the calmest of the entire game during the most stressful part. Um, what did you think of that for one, just like as a sports guy? And then what is what is Patrick like? I believe he's an investor, right? Obviously, like he he rides for and represents the product. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Well, it's it was a great moment. And, um, and I'll tell you exactly when it was. It was the AFC championship game against the Bills. And... There was two minutes left in the game. And over the course of those two minutes, I think there was three or four lead changes. Like it was just this crazy back and forth game. And Josh Allen, the quarterback for the Bills, played incredibly well. And what we were able to show with the whoop data is that Mahomes, when he was on the sidelines, was actually more stressed out than – in those final 30 seconds where he had to go down the field and score a touchdown. And uh, it's a theme that uh, Patrick certainly uh, exemplifies, but I've, I've, I've realized many professional athletes uh, do as well, which is this idea of uh, controlling the controllables. And, and when you're in that place of focusing on those things you actually feel the most at peace. So when he was, you know, uh, on the sidelines, it was a circumstance that he really couldn't control. And in fact, that was stressing him out. That was part of the he, jokes I saw. People were like, he was watching his his backs, yeah. his defensive backs and his line just like stressed out. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and yet when the game was on the line, he actually got to this really calm state, which... I think many sports psychologists would call a flow state given the circumstances. Uh, and, and so it was a pretty, it was a pretty amazing moment. And uh, I think speaks to, uh, to Patrick's uh, mental training as much as, as his, his physical training. 
Uh, he's someone who we talked about this on the Whoop podcast together, but he's someone who, who focuses on visualization before games. So tries to put himself in circumstances like that before he's even there. Many professional athletes do that. He's someone who focuses on breathing. Breathing can play a big role in controlling your heart rate and managing stress in different moments. Uh, and you, you, you kind of can notice this when you watch the world's best athletes, especially the, the, the athletes who are later stages of their career. When you watch them come down the stretch, they have a certain calm about them that's almost like eerie. And you'll often see their breathing through their nose. I mean, these are, these are just techniques that over time you can really ingrain, um, especially under high pressure. And I think about it as an entrepreneur too, like you don't want to be the person jumping up and down when things are going well and the person jumping up and down when things are going poorly. You want to stay really calm and and have a steady hand. So I think there's a lot of takeaways from uh, sports and athletes that you can apply to everyday life. And in many ways, that's what's really exciting about Whoop is, is we've built a brand on that notion that human performance extends from the world's best athletes to everyone else. You've worked with uh, a lot of the best athletes, even beyond Patrick Mahomes. I know that LeBron James, Michael Phelps, they were among the very first to use Whoop. Um, and then, you know, I've seen Rory McElroy, Kevin Durant is an investor, right? Um, yeah. With all of those, Eli Manning as well. But we love to hear about, like, something that maybe no one else knows and not, and not anything salacious, just like a bit of advice or have you been on a, a conference call or just like, you know, getting a lunch or something with one of these guys or, you know, women. And there was just something that you took away from dealing with like these elite people where you're like, okay, I can apply that to my life. You know, any, any gems that you picked up in your interactions? Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you the first thing that came to mind, and then I, I, I probably have one or two more. But the um, one of the coolest moments for me in this whole world of of getting to work with professional athletes was pretty early in the company's history. So this is maybe 2014, I think like late 2014, early 2015. And the company was founded in 2012. And the first few years were really hardcore technology development. So we didn't have that many people on Whoop. In fact, we had about 100 people on Whoop. Uh, now, it so happened that one of them was LeBron James. And at that point, I, I didn't have much direct interaction with LeBron, but I had gotten to know his trainer, uh, Mike Mencius, and Mike had become a friend. And I knew that Mike was working with LeBron using the product. And I'm at home uh, with my parents, and I remember it was around Christmas because we were watching the um, the holiday games that come on. And lo and behold, on comes this Kia commercial. LeBron was sponsored by Kia at the time, and it was like LeBron James in like a space suit about to get launched into outer space. And sure enough, what's he wearing in the commercial? But a whoop strap. <laughs> and I remember thinking it was the coolest thing because there weren't that many in the world. And the fact that LeBron was wearing one was epic, but also the fact that uh, he he must have been so hooked on it that he wouldn't even take it off during another brand's commercial. Kind of like uh, the classic when uh, yeah. LL Cool J went in the Gap commercial and wore the FUBU hat. And it was basically right. like a covert yeah. ad for FUBU. Yeah, exactly. Beats by Dre did a lot of stuff like that. Yeah, so, I know. they. I worked at Beats, man. They're... I, that oh, cool. that London 2012, they had. I mean, they changed the rules because every yeah, swimmer, yeah. and that was just like groundwork, man. That was just people over there seating athletes, and every athlete you saw, Michael Phelps, everyone getting out of the pool, the track athletes, they all had on beats. I love like guerrilla marketing like that. I'm kind of a nerd in that way. I love it too, and I I think a lot about how what you wear says something about your identity. And Beats did a great job of that where they made not just what you listen to part of your identity, but how you listen to it as part of your identity, right? And and for Whoop, with health monitoring, you know, one thing I found in researching the whole space, this, is, this goes back to when I was a, a student at Harvard and I didn't really know any better, but 
you know, I just felt like the whole space was um, definitively not cool. I mean, health monitoring was a stigma. It, you know, if you were wearing a health monitor, there's something wrong with you. Yeah. And that got me interested in this question of, you know, what if you could make health monitoring cool and aspirational? And what would be the process for doing that, first of all? And then what kind of an impact could that have on society? Because all of a sudden now it's cool to have, you know, a healthy lifestyle or a performance lifestyle. So, you know, I grew up really uh, inspired by brands like Nike and just the fact that you could, you know, wearing a cotton shirt that was blank versus the same exact cotton shirt with a swoosh on it, it just changed the way you felt. Why was that, you know? Uh and you and know so, what you just said about health not to cut you off but i have to i don't know if you ever saw this um wall street journal article from maybe a couple months ago yeah it was september i i have referenced this before because i just think it's really interesting about how health has evolved as a cool factor it says yachts and watches the real ceo flexes washboard abs um that article is interesting i believe when um Elon was like on a yacht with Ari Emanuel and you could just tell like the difference right. in, in their fitness. Ari looked good. Elon didn't. Yeah. Yeah. And Elon was like, yo, I'm about to go fasting. I'm about to get my whole body together. But look, the, the richest man in the world is feeling some level of, you know, insecurity or, or need to like get the health, their health right. One, you look at like a genius like Steve Jobs, who I think showed us no matter what, you're not guaranteed to be here and, and many other examples, but I just find it fascinating that right now you have all these guys with all their billions. Uh, they can get any yacht, they can get any car, but the real flex is having your body and your health on point. Well, the reason I know about that article is because it was sent to me by three whoop members, <laughs> um, two of which were in the article. So, uh, it, uh, yeah, it certainly spoke to a core demographic. Yeah, totally. Well, when you talk about the space overall, um, and I've seen you speak on this before, but but we're here face to face. I really uh, am curious. There's just a lot of competition, right? You got Fitbit, Google bought them for a couple billion, you know, not too long ago. Uh, although Peloton is probably not the threat that it seemed like a couple years ago. There was like, hey, they're working on a wearable. Um, Apple, of course, Apple Watch changed the game. Like, how does Whoop rise up when you have the biggest tech companies in the world trying to encroach on your space? You know, we have to stay focused and we have to stay true to our ident identity. Uh, competition's always been an interesting <laughs> phenomenon in this space because there's been a lot of players in the space, uh, but for the most part, they, they've struggled. And um, I think it speaks to just how hard it is to build wearable technology uh, and to drive towards health monitoring. You know, you look at, let's take sports apparel brands as a starting point. Um, just over the last 10 years, uh, Nike came out with the Fuel Band. Uh, Adidas came out with the Me Coach. Um, Under Armour spent about a billion dollars acquiring companies. Kevin Plank on the cover of Forbes saying that health monitoring was the future of Under Armour. Um, and then they I, 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 I still use my fitness pal, but I know that they got rid of it. Yeah. So all the, all those products failed, all those strategies failed. And again, really good companies. Uh, you look at the technology space. Microsoft came out with a smartwatch um, that they pulled. Um, Intel bought a company and then recalled it. Uh, Google's had starts and stops. Um, you know, I think Apple's really been the most successful. Uh, Samsung has struggled to their own admission. Um, and then you look at the startup space. This is a much longer list, but there's probably some 20 companies uh, that if I sat here long enough, I could I could list off for you. Uh, you know, Fit, Fitbit has kind of been one of the more successful stories 
They went public though at about eight billion. They sold at two billion, so it's still a little bit of a uh, makes you squint a little bit in terms of that outcome. Uh, Jawbone raised about a billion dollars and went bankrupt. And I bring this up just because it demonstrates, I think, how hard the space is. And so, if tomorrow you told me fill in the blank company is now doing a version of Whoop, like. I'd say good luck. You know, it's it's just that hard. The space is that hard. You're wearing something all the time, so it starts to bleed into fashion and identity. You have to have really good analytics and algorithms. You have to be great at software and design. Um, and and so I don't know. I I we've been successful by not trying to do everything. You know, uh, it's not a watch. It doesn't have a screen. You can't, you know, make phone calls with it. You can't flag an Uber, right? Like right. it's, it's, uh, it's health monitoring and we try to be the best game in town for that. And then we have a specific lens in terms of how we think about health monitoring strain and recovery and sleep and certain alerts. And, you know, we don't measure steps. Um, we don't have GPS. Like there's a bunch of things that we've chosen not to do. And I think every technology company that's entered the space has sort of looked at what everyone else does and said, okay, we'll do all those things. And what you end up with is a product without a point of view Mm -hmm. and often real concessions around battery life or data accuracy, uh, wearability, you know, these things all have trade-offs, Ernest. So uh, Whoop will will try to, you know, we'll try to stay true to our identity going forwards and, and try to stay focused. So with all that, I think that's a really helpful understanding of like how one goes up against Google and Apple. Um, and congrats to you on the success that you've seen so far in such a difficult and crowded space. But you also, even the company cited challenges when you all, I believe, announced or had some type of statement about having uh, the layoffs and uh, like 15% of the workforce is cut. The market in general is insane. You got Amazon laying off 10,000 people, their biggest ever. It's like Whoop is going through that. The trillion dollar market cap companies are going through it. Um, Also, I really think that FTX just shattered everyone's perception of how this stuff works, raises and valuations. I remember almost being like a little jealous of Sam Bankman Freed because I was like, this dude's a couple years younger than me. He's the next Warren Buffett. He's worth all these billions. His company's worth 32 billion. He's raised in numerous billions. And you know, it, it all came crashing down in like a matter of days. And and this isn't anything like tech super new. We saw it dot com bubble. You know, you go back and say we saw it with the tulip. Um, wasn't it the tulip back in the in Holland back in the days with the Dutch? Um, like these these things they can they can come and go. Um so like how do how do you stop from being one of those companies? It's like, oh yeah, they, they were worth three, four billion dollars, and they raised hundreds of millions of dollars, and now they're not here. Like, like what do you you do? Um, because like publicly, people are just they might look and say, oh, they had some layoffs. They're beginning that that downward spiral. Um, and I guess you know, getting the chance to talk to the CEO, I wonder like what's the reality of the situation. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a it's an unusual macro environment right now. So you have to be thoughtful and disciplined um, as you build a business, and you have to be, uh, you know, cognizant of market shifts. So one market shift, at least in the technology sector, has been grow, grow, grow. To okay, you can grow, but like profitability, right? And, uh, and so, okay, if the market values one versus the other, you don't want to find yourself too far on, on the wrong end of a spectrum, right? And I think that's what you're seeing a lot of technology businesses, particularly late stage startups, uh, reconcile. And fortunately for Whoop, we have a recurring revenue business. We have a very 
loyal community that wears the product every day. Uh, we're continuing to grow year over year as a business. So those are sort of the things you would look at. Um, at least you would look at first to say, Hey, is there a problem here? Or, uh, are you trying to, you know, react to the market environment? And, and for us, it's, it's really been, uh, being mindful of, of, of market dynamics. I think that, uh, I, you know, I, I'm not going to p- try to predict whether we're in a recession or we're going into a recession or how long that is. I think you just want to make sure you're running a business with discipline and and trying to put as much control in your, you know, control your own destiny as much as possible, which is a theme we touched on earlier. That's really all you can do sometimes. Just try to yeah. – I, I always find – um you know, tunnel vision to, in some aspects, like you need an awareness of the macro environment, but looking at what everyone's doing all the time really knocks you off track from, from being able to figure out like your own path. So definitely understand that. Um, wondering. And, and the other thing to keep ahead. in mind is, I think the other thing to, think, to keep in mind is that, you know, A harder market to raise capital is not necessarily a bad thing. Like a lot of these uh, headline statements are really oversimplifying the circumstance. You know, uh, tech is down uh, and could go through a really long or really prolonged period of negative growth. Like a headline like that misses out on the fact that, okay, now – Many startups aren't going to be competing for hiring against Google and Apple and Facebook and Amazon like they had to for the last, you know, 20 years, right? Uh, It used to be every engineering offer you sent to someone, they had, you know, an offer from Google for twice as much and you had to prove your equity value. Like, okay, some of that stuff's not going to be happening because those companies are now pulling way back. Uh, Okay, so maybe it makes for a better um, talent environment. You know, maybe it creates a culture for founders of uh, of really uh, managing burn rate responsibly, which as as someone who's gone through various cycles over the last 10 years, I think is a really important like learning experience uh, for any founder. It was certainly it was certainly useful for me at times where, uh, you know, cash was short. So. I actually think in the next two years, like some of the most valuable businesses are going to be started. If you fast forward another five or eight years, like you'll look at this two year window we're about to enter and be like, wow, some really great companies and founders came out of that period. And for later stage businesses like Whoop, which, you know, aren't public yet, but that's probably the next step. I think what you're going to see is, uh, you know, a fair amount of uh, consolidation. And so you're going to see companies that were, um, you know, all kind of in a similar stage and some are going to take huge leaps forward and some are going to get caught up in the mess or mismanage their own financings and uh, and get kind of lost behind. And so it's going to be an important time to be, I think, on your front foot and and looking for opportunities. The 2020s has been just a wild ride so far. <laughs> like, you yeah. know, just the way that we're seeing like culture and the tech conversation and everything develop. Um, it's it's quite a time that we're living in. Do you want to get acquired one day? Is that like a focus? I know you're, like you said, you're late stage, so you're this close to going public, but are you hoping like, you know, Apple comes in and says we need you guys. Here's like a few billion. At every stage of building this company, it's gotten more exciting to build. And, it, and as the company's gotten bigger, it also has grown more and more to look like a standalone business. So for those reasons, I'm pretty excited about the prospect of taking the company public or whatever that future uh, uh, end state is of, of, of financing, but not, uh, not uh, necessarily to be acquired, no. 
how many subscribers are you at right now? Also, because I know that's like part of your strategy. You're not just trying to sell hardware. You have a subscriber base that gives you that recurring revenue. So what number are you at? Well, fortunately, as a private business, we don't have to share those numbers publicly. So I'll keep that close to the chest. But um, I can tell you that switching to be a subscription business. So we did that in uh, May of 2018. And before that, we were selling hardware. So it was a one-time fee. And then starting in May of 2018, you could sign up for as little as 30 bucks a month. And um, and now you can you know pay anywhere between 20 and $30 a month if you're interested in Whoop. And that like transition created this enormous inflection for the business. First of all, it helped us um, move a lot of product because people all of a sudden could could sign up at a much lower rate. Uh, and then it in turn also put us in the position of being a subscription business where you're sort of valued like a different type of company in that mindset. And then lastly, it changed our DNA internally because now we were in the business of shipping software and analytics and new features as fast as we possibly could because we're fighting for your business every day, every week, every month. Mm-hmm. And the combination of those things. I think has made us a much better company. So you mentioned earlier, you went to Harvard. You were, I believe, the captain on the varsity squash team. Uh, you grew up in Long Island, right? Your yeah. dad was an Egyptian immigrant. Like that first part of your life before you get out and you become an entrepreneur and you build a business because you pretty much like didn't really work too much at other jobs, at least like looking at your LinkedIn, you kind of like got out and, you know, did a couple things, but started building your business right away. Um, at least like, like I said, from an outside perspective, that's what it looks like. So what was that kind of like pre whoop story for you, whether growing up in Long Island, this like squash thing and, <laughs> um, and, and, you know, even just like being at Harvard, um, you know, what, who, who is Will Ahmed before Whoop? Yeah. So I grew up on the North shore of Long Island. Um, my dad, uh, an Egyptian immigrant came to this country with very little when he was 22 and, uh, through some combination of persistence and charisma rose the ranks and in, uh, in finance. And, um, and my mom, very book smart, very analytical, a writer, uh, uh, you know, my dad extroverted, my mom introverted, you know, in many ways, my parents were real opposites, uh, are real opposites. And, uh, and yet, uh, and I was an only child too. So I spent a lot of time with them. I spent a lot of time with other adults. I bring th- these things up because I think they, they also in turn made me more comfortable starting a company or being the youngest person in the room often. Uh, but, but growing up, um, as my parents' son, I I think I uh, saw different ways to solve problems on a real extreme end. There was an analytical way. There was a, you know, run through a wall way and everything in between. And I think that was, that was a pretty helpful framework uh, for certainly becoming an entrepreneur um, years later. I played a ton of uh, sports, probably 10 different sports, uh, and squash ended up being the one I think that I was best at. And I went to a, a boarding school in New Hampshire called St. Paul's. I played uh, five or six different sports there uh, over the over the course of four years and, and got recruited to Harvard to play uh, squash. It's also worth noting around, you know, from that period of like 10 to – maybe 15, I was really interested in technology. I didn't know that one day I was going to work in technology, but it makes sense now looking backwards. I had uh, the first iPod in my, you know, I think it was sixth grade class, that like really cool thick iPod with the wheel. Um, I thought it was four buttons across. Well, I know the first one had them like around the wheel, but that third generation, when they put the across the top and it became like the wheel wasn't mechanical, it was like touch. I remember getting that in, in 2004, like changed my life. (laughs) 
Yeah, it was, it was amazing. And, uh, and actually it helped me start whoop in a, in a weird way because I was so inspired by this product. I took money that I made for, from caddying and I invested in Apple stock at this like young age. And I remember my dad like set up this, this, um, uh, way I could trade stocks because he wanted me to get interested in the stock market. And I kind of went all in on Apple and that would have been like around the jobs return moment. So the stock ended up doing this incredible inflection over the next 10 years. And part of the way I was able to like, uh, afford starting a business, um, was, uh, was selling Apple shares uh, to sort of pay for, you know, rent and things of that nature. That so, is you know, crazy. Sort of I mean, full circle. whenever I see, you know, some type of like prompt meme or something, it's like, what would you tell yourself 10 years ago? It's like half of the responses are always like buy Apple stock. <laughs> you just had the vision as a kid. Also shout out as a fellow caddy. That was my first, first gig. I was probably like 13, 14. And, uh, you know, you do a bunch of stuff when you're a kid coming up. I I did work at the grocery store. I did do some, I worked at Sears selling like stoves and microwaves and stuff. Um, but those were all like pretty short lived. I caddied from eighth grade up until probably like my first couple years of college before I went to start doing like internships in the field that I'm working in. And, oh man, that was, that was great. Right. Like you would get like real money, cash in hand. Don't let it, you know, you know, the guys who are going to tip super well, you get the, the, the big events where the guests come and they're tipping. I just remember I was like 15 and the first time I held a thousand cash in my hands. And I thought I was like the man, you know, I thought I made it. And now, and now dude, as an adult having kids and stuff, a thousand is like, is like that. But definitely like helped build me up. I'm sure the same story for you, Caddy. Yeah. You know, it, it's something you look back on really fondly. Like I think I learned a lot of good, um, uh, good values from that experience. And I did it every summer, probably from 13 to 18, something like mm -hmm. that. And it was such a grind, but, uh, Working for tips, I think, is a good experience for any young person. And you learn a lot about people's personalities. You learn about your own work ethic. And, uh, yeah, I remember working, like, really hard to, you know, hopefully get that extra 20 or, or whatever it was. If you're car um, shagging and you, like, you're, yeah, like, sprinting you after they hit, you know? The worst thing is not seeing a ball, though. Like, dude, one time. A hawk came and like took my golfer's ball, the ball like down the fairway, and I was just like, oh, but you know, so so many like you know fun stories from that time. Plus, like being a teenager in the caddy shack and stuff, you got the older guys. You're, you know, maybe you might party with your your fellow caddies and stuff after everybody's off and has made some nice money for the day. It was it was a cool experience coming up. Yeah, and and it's um. It's also, I think, important to do a, a labor-intensive job uh, at, at some point in your life because it it makes you appreciate too mental stress versus physical stress. Like grinding through a day where you were tired, doing a manual job. I mean, at least in my case, it was caddying. But comparing that to a day where you're tired and grinding through Zoom calls and in-person meetings and catered lunches, it's just like. I don't know. I think it's, I think it's an easier, it's an easier experience. That's not to say you won't be feeling stressed and this and that, but, uh, I got a lot out of that experience of caddying. Uh, I went to Harvard and, uh, I was playing squash there and I was someone who used to overtrain. So overtraining is where you get fitter and fitter and then you kind of fall off a cliff and you don't really know why. And you're kind of run down for a couple of weeks and it's sort of like, all the symptoms of being sick without having a cough or a cold, you're just kind of run down. And I didn't, I didn't really fully understand why that was the case. And it seemed odd to me that I was at this school, which was all about higher education. And yet no one could really explain to me what it meant to train optimally. 
and there was really nothing you could measure about it. And so that that little question of how could I measure my body, how could I train optimally, just started nagging at me. And it took me down this incredible rabbit hole of physiology research as a student. And uh, I read something like 500 medical papers. Um, my, 500 medical papers. I wrote a paper myself around how to continuously measure the human body. I uh, I then took a class at uh, MIT's business school on how to uh, write a business plan if you have an idea. So it was, uh, yeah, it was a lot of it was a lot of work. And in the process, I think what I was really doing was building the confidence to start a company. You know, you asked me earlier, what are other things that I've learned from professional athletes? One big theme is if you're nervous, be prepared. Like just be as prepared as possible. I had this conversation with Michael Phelps and we were about the next day, we were going to play in a a golf pro-am and um, a lot of people were going to watch a certain shot that we were going to hit. It was this waste management tournament. There's a shot on 16 that has I think like 25,000 people on this one hole watching you hit. And uh, Michael was saying to me, you know, I'm going to be more nervous for that shot than I was before any race I had at the Olympics. And I'm like, you're kidding me. Like you're, you're lining up for a gold medal race and you're not nervous. And he said, you know, when I got on those blocks, I knew that I had done everything possible for that moment. There was nothing more I could do. And all that was left to do was race. And because of that, he actually didn't feel nerves before these epic performances. Now, you know, he, he, he had, um, a number of talents, but, but he also uh, was listening to Lil Wayne before he got yeah, in that the pool, so. so, um, anyway, so the, the, the message there was, uh, to be prepared. And, um, Again, I didn't realize I was starting a company when I did all this research. I think I was just on a daily basis obsessed with an idea and, you know, deeply, deeply examining it. And and then I did work a, a few summers in finance. I worked at a hedge fund. I worked at an investment bank. I worked at a private equity firm. And the question I was asking myself at those firms was, did I want to be my boss's boss's boss, right? Like if I could, did I want to be that person? And, uh, and for me, you know, as much as I respected the people I was working with and, and they were really good firms, I just didn't picture myself as, as that person. And, uh, and so I didn't love it. Yeah. I didn't love the work. And I'm, I'm someone who, the spectrum of my performance between loving something and disliking it, like the performance starts to get really wide. Totally. So, so, uh, we have a lot, we have a lot in common with some of these things, whether it's the caddying yeah. or I, I was a business student. I, I was, I went to Illinois and, you know, accounting finance. And it was the summer that I was in the finance department at Rolls Royce um, which is not as cool as it sounds because really Rolls Royce is like a Rust Belt industrial company based in Indianapolis. Like they just make, they make engines for the military and for right. jets and cruise ships. And so it was like this really just, I'm going to a factory in Indianapolis and I'm sitting doing bank reconciliations and stuff all day. And the next summer I was in New York city doing my first media internship and that's where my career went from there. But, you know, similar position of getting into business. I always thought, oh, you want to be successful in life? Well, you just like have to do business. My dad was a CPA like that. And he never even pressured me. I, that was just my model for success. And once I actually got in that seat and once, you know, I stopped partying the first two years of college and started sitting in those level 300, 400 tax law classes and stuff, I was like, I need to go talk about sports and music and entertainment because like that's where my heart is at yeah and and one thing people can take from this is you know it's great opportunities to take internships and um and surround yourself too with with people in a bunch of different industries because uh independent from figuring out what you do want to do you can quickly figure out what you don't want to do too. Mm-hmm. And, and some of this is a process of elimination. So, 
you know, for me, that's what was valuable about internships is it took me four weeks or eight weeks to realize something that, you know, I've now had friends graduating from Harvard. It took them 10 years, unfortunately, to realize the thing that they've been chasing, they don't want to chase. Are you still out here playing squash? Yeah, I still play. Uh, depending on the time of the year, I'll play anywhere from one to three times a week. And uh, I love it. It's a, it's a sport that also, from a whoop, whoop perspective, like I can get a very high strain in a reasonable amount of time, like 45 minutes or an hour. I can get a really high score on whoop because it's an activity I'm trained at doing. And it also is a sport just that gets your – your heart rate really elevated. So I like, I like, um, I like that. I also have gotten into weightlifting, you know, when I was 20 years old, I was very cardiovascularly fit, but I wasn't that strong looking back on it. So at least now it feels good to be getting better at something like year over year. I feel like I'm, I wish I started lifting like 10 years earlier. Cause I'll like, I'll just keep yeah. it real. I just want it to be like slim. Right. You know, I just wanted to have a calorie deficit and I just would run a lot at a, in college or like in my early twenties and, and probably in the past three years, I've realized like weight training is everything, or at least it is for me. It took, it took my, physical routines to like a different level. And uh, I, I understand where you're coming from. Yeah. And there's so much research to show how much it improves later stages of life, um, lifting weights. And I also think there's just something to be said for doing things as an adult that you can keep getting better at. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're a kid, like everything that you do, you're almost getting better at right? Like even if you're like mediocre at a sport, you're getting better at it year over year. And then something happens like around the age of 25, where you as an adult are kind of told, um, Hey, you're just going to kind of decline in from here to 80. And right. Like that's like the worst advice, um, that culture somehow seems to pass down. There's so many things that, uh, sports activities, um, uh, lifestyle choices that you can make to be getting a little better. And, uh, and so that's how I think about it. Yeah. I even feel being in my early thirties now, I kind of feel like lied to by culture, like how, <laughs> you know, they tell you your twenties are the best years of your life. And when you're hitting your thirties, you're getting older and stuff. And it's like, it couldn't be further from the truth. I had a great time in my twenties. Uh, I've had a better time in my thirties. It's like, what is not better about knowing yourself a little bit more, probably being a little bit more financially stable, um, you know, just having been through some of the chaos of those years and, you know, I f and kind of like becoming a man. Like, I feel like, of course, you know, you do have responsibility in your 20s. You are a grown man technically, but like I was a kid really that whole time. Now, yeah. You know, I'm still a kid in my heart. I think we all still retain that, which is good. I think that's how, like, where real creativity comes from. Like, like I look at my daughter and the way that she does art, it's so, it doesn't lack that self-conscious that gets, like, beat into us through the decades of failure and doubt and people saying crap to you and stuff. It's just, like, pure intuition and it's very hard to tap into that when you're an adult, but like when you can, when you can just like let all of the mess fall by the wayside and just go from the heart, I think special things can happen. Yeah, that's great advice. And, uh, and I imagine it's a trip having kids. I don't have kids yet. I'm married, but don't have kids yet. And, uh, I imagine that's a whole, whole nother life stage. Yeah, no, nah, it's uh, it's pretty cool. I'm sure you've heard from enough people. It's life changing, et cetera. But, you know, it is cool outside of all the cliches. Just, you know, you talk about like physiology, you talk about like how a person develops to watch it so firsthand like that. And, you know, you get them in sports, you start to see their cognitive abilities improve. Um, you know, it's cool. I, I just I want them to be the best people they can be. So I got a question for you. You strike me as a guy who's pretty plugged into culture, but you said that 
you feel culture has lied to us about, you know, who we should be as adults. Where where do you feel like you're getting the best information and where do you feel like you're not getting good information? So I'm I'm like a pop culture fanatic. I told you I was in a finance position and then I moved to to media and I love music and I've met every rapper or singer or a lot of athletes and movie stars like you know and that's just like comes with the territory right the same same as since i've been doing this show it's been really cool for me to be like oh i sat down with the ceo of crossfit i sat down with the ceo of whoop like all these like important cool companies um so with all of that said uh, as much as I love pop culture, I feel like that is where the bad information came from. Like you're so, like you're so impressionable as a younger person, um, and just a lot of the stuff that's sold to you is like what a good life looks like, what type of man you're supposed to be. You know, I've even like on like a regret level, kind of look back sometimes, and I'm like, especially when you look back at like '90s or 2000s stuff, like you know. There's, I'm not going to get into the whole like woke, whatever political thing. I do think that there's some ways that like we maybe go too far in censoring ourselves in ways that we didn't used to in the past, but it's also coming from like a good place of being inclusive and, and just like not being obscene, like a lot of the stuff that we grew up on was. And I look back and I'm like, that's what molded me. Like, cause it's all violent. It's all like degrading. And I'm just like, mm, that wasn't though. Like Tarantino movies and like gangster rap weren't necessarily <laughs> like should have been my motto. I had great parents, super involved. Like it's not all that I had, but you just, you live by that stuff a little bit too much when you're younger. I think getting out into the real world um, and especially talking to like, like people a little bit older. I love my buddies who are in their late thirties and their forties, just having some life experience of my own, like having hardships that probably stem from this flawed mentality I had. So it's like the BS on TV was the worst information and the best is like real successful friends or my own life experiences. Yeah, that's cool. Makes sense. Yeah. What is find, your, well, go ahead. I, I, I want to ask like, what's your deal with pop culture, but what do you say you find what? Well, yeah, I, I think it's, I think we kind of live in this really unique time where there's never been so much information, uh, which is distracting in many ways, but there's never, it's never been easier to get to the source so, you know, the culture that I try to frame for myself is not like how, I mean, you're, you're into music and artists. It's not how Rolling Stone or GQ portrays Jay-Z. It's listening to like a two-hour interview with Jay-Z and Howard Stern or reading his book. You know, it's like trying to go as close to the source as possible. And the podcast industry, I think, has been amazing for this because if there's someone you respect out there, you can almost definitely find an hour or two hours of that person just talking about their life in a very unfiltered way. And I think that, at least for me, has been a helpful – it's been a helpful lens to understand people or understand industries, understand success and failure is like going as close to the source as possible. And are you, you bring up Jay-Z, we're talking about the impression of, of film and all these different things on us growing up, but like, you are this squash star, were you big into music or film? Are you, are you an art guy? You got certain stuff hanging up in your house? Like what, when you're not building whoop, um, you know, or like in the gym kind of keeps you inspired or, you know, piques your interest? Well, that makes me think of another question. Like, how, how good are you at separating the artist from the person? I, I think just to answer your question, I'm very good at separating art from the artist in the sense that I can enjoy a quote unquote problematic person's art. Like it stands on its own. I think over time, when you like fall out of love with someone, you probably go to their art 
a lot less. Like I, I don't want to hear stuff from certain people, um, you know, once certain things are revealed about them, but like, we're all flawed. So I don't get into like the judgment game. Like we, we all have made mistakes. We've all said or done things that like weren't great. Uh, the, the goal is to learn from it, right? The goal that that's why it's like, I am in this phase where I'm trying to like grow up and get away from some of the stuff that I was, you know, taught by the culture and by the media to value for a long time in my life. You know, I'm seeing what things are really about a little bit more now. Um, that said, it is kind of disheartening that like all my heroes, or at least a good portion of them are, are like really flawed. Like, like we all are, and I'm very forgiving, but it's just like, uh, these are my heroes. And now I see they are all like, like they're all kind of, have their issues that I don't, maybe if I love them or love their art, but I shouldn't be looking up to them as a person. And that's something that just in the past few years, you know, like you go from this, this borderline obsession with these people and you follow everything about their career and their early life. And you want to, you know, imitate this or that. And it's like, it takes me back to my mom used to say to me when I was that pop culture obsessed 16 year old watching TRL and Jay-Z and Kanye and everyone and how much I love them. She would just always be like, okay, that's cool. But like, you can do that too. Like, don't get all caught up in worshiping them. You can go do the same things. And so like, that's helped me in my career. And maybe it's a little bit disappointing that some of my heroes are, you know, not quite the person that I thought they were, but I'm at a point in my life where that's not really going to impact me too much you know if a song comes on i can enjoy it i can also very candidly just acknowledge the fact that this isn't cool about this person you know i'm not like a stan who needs to defend them but that that's how i feel but what what about you like whether it's the heroes aspect or just like the stuff that you like you know well i think it's similar i you know, we took this a slightly different direction, but I would say I, I have a similar relationship with these things where I too can separate the, uh, the art from the artist. Um, and, you know, growing up again, I, I was, I was influenced a lot by athletes. Um, I, you know, Tiger Woods comes to mind. Michael Jordan comes to mind. These like very, singular transcendent athletes and just the way they could make you feel not just inspired by a sport, but sort of inspired to be a human. Like the idea that a performance like that is possible under the circumstances. Uh, and, and then the other related point, and I know this keeps this loops back to whoop a little bit, but it was the way that um, Nike told stories about those specific athletes because it wasn't just the perfect athletes. It was also really, really beautiful storytelling that, um, you know, elevated these moments. There's a really good, uh, there's like an amazing uh, Tiger Woods commercial where it's his father narrating it. And it's these different shots of Tiger Woods and him growing up. And it's just like so beautiful uh, and the way it encompasses his career and this mindset. And it's something like Earl was saying, like, you know, you'll, I told Tiger, you're never going to meet someone as mentally tough as you are. And he hasn't, and he, and he won't. And then, you know, it's like this just do it moment. It's just really beautiful. Um, there was a great story about Michael Jordan wearing Nike socks in the early nineties, might've been late eighties. And there was a deal with the NBA where you weren't allowed, allowed to wear a different brand socks. And um, and the NBA, I think, issued kind of a low fee, like a low fine for it. And it created this this mania around the socks. And so Nike just said, you know what? Wear them every game. We're going to pay the, the fine every single game. And it goes back to this sort of guerrilla marketing and, uh, you know, being like a little bit disruptive. But these are some of the stories that, uh, you know, influenced me. You know, going back to caddying, and I, I grew up in the Chicago area, that was one of the things where I realized that, like, the marketing that we had been sold was different than who these people were. Sure. And I love Jordan and, like, whatever 
the fact that he's like a bad tipper on the golf course, like never would take away from the fact that like he gave me six championships in my youth from the, from the time I had consciousness, I knew my team was going to win always. And that, and that's a special way if you're into sports to like, I didn't have adversity. Like my first memories are like the 72 and 10 season, you know? Um, But that said, like there was almost like a lore among the Chicago area caddies, you know, if he shows up at your country club, like don't expect the billionaire tip or whatever, he might give you $50, <laughs> you know, like, um, so yeah, that was one of those things. But like, I, I love all these people. It's just something that when you get older, like you realize a lot of stuff was marketing. Like, I think like that's sort of like that moment for me where I'm just like, a lot of stuff that I believed in so much was marketing and uh, just trying to find like the truth in things. But I still didn't get an answer from you in terms of just like music, film, art. Is there anything on that level that you're just like, yeah, this is, this is a big part of like who I am. I'm thinking about, series or movies music that influenced me you know i loved the harry potter series uh when i was growing up reading that i also i'm guessing you and i are the same age but i think like harry and his cast of friends were about the same age like i think we were roughly the same age through yeah. each book which was kind of a weird phenomenon uh so it was literally like growing up with harry potter and it, to me, it was fascinating. You could just invent a world like that and have so many layers to the world. Uh, oh, that also yeah. got me in, got me into reading too. Um, the uh, you know Tarantino's movies I've always really loved because they feel so authentically him. It's. It, I think it's the mark of a great artist where a novice observer can tell that it's a specific artist. Yes. You know, it's not like I'm an expert on film. I never studied film, but you know, if I watched like, um, Pulp Fiction and Inglorious Bastards, and then someone made me watch, um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, like I would be able to tell, or Django Unchained, like I'd be able to tell that those movies were made by the same person because of um, their style. Uh, Aaron Sorkin's like that too, as a writer. Oh my where, God, dude. The, I mean, first of all, he, he's the like, man. He Social Network, I saw it October I 1st, 2010. The opening it. night, it was packed. Me and my friend couldn't even sit next to each other. I actually went home and started writing my first script after I saw that because I was like, just blown away by Sorkin. Um, so they filmed actually a lot of that movie at Harvard while I was at Harvard. And because I was also into, you know, the idea of entrepreneurship too, like that movie hit home in a number of ways. Right. I remember walking out the theater and my friend said to me, I feel like I got to get some paper. Like, you know, we were just inspired. Like we literally went home. He's like, I'm drawing up a business plan. I'm like, I'm yeah, right. writing a script, you know? But yeah, I love Sorkin. They need to, I'm sure they're already on the phone trying to get him to write the Sam Bankman free FTX story. Like, like that would be an amazing kind of like scandalous film. They are, they're all saying already Jonah Hill should play Sam. Like, dude. That movie is is set up to be a cult classic if uh, if we can get the script in Sorkin's hands. So yeah, so I think a theme is is um, admiring work where it's very clear to to uh, identify the artist. Part of what uh, I like a lot about Billie Eilish, who admittedly I'm not the biggest fan of her work. Like I'm not, I wouldn't call myself a hardcore fan, but. I remember the first time I listened to her, like immediately feeling like it was a distinct sound, which again is a hard thing to do. Like it's really hard to, to authentically come out as your own thing. You know, a lot of times I feel like an artist is described as, oh, he's like X meets Y or, you know, or it's like, mm -hmm. it's, it's clear they're borrowing a ton of influences 
Whereas uh, when I first heard her music, I was like, wow, that's very distinct. Um, so I guess, I guess what I'm gravitating towards is uh, a fe- like feelings of authenticity coming from artists. Well, I was going to ask, like, how do you, knowing that those are the type of things you gravitated toward and were inspired by, bringing that into Whoop, working with your team, working with the designers, like it's so much bigger than just tracking and physiology. Like design is incredibly important. I always love the Steve Jobs story where I think they were working on like the original Macintosh or something. And there was some type of internal design that he didn't like, like no one would ever see it. And he like told all his engineers, like, I don't really care. I want this to be perfect too. And you know now look we're in a different time where a lot of his stuff people have said oh that was abusive and and things like that and i'm not really here to debate that but i do think that level of like control and obsession with like every facet of something being perfect how many whoop prototypes are you going through how how many you know sketches are you seeing and just like are you like what's your style you know are you someone who's just kind of I don't want to say chill because I don't know if you can build a company like this and be chill, but like, what is your style with managing a team? Are you like a very intense person and you know, we're going to go through a hundred drafts of a design before we get there? Or, or do you try to like, you know, let other people have more autonomy or like what? Well, I think when it comes to product, one thing I believe is that you want to have a strong point of view on what the world looks like when your product's being used successfully. And there's sort of two different ways to think about building uh, products. One is what I just described. The other is a little bit more of a um, minimum viable product, minimum viable product, minimum viable product test, iterate, you know, loop, test, iterate, loop. And Whoop has very much been a, uh, here's the big vision, let's go build it. There's a lot of things along the way of building the company, our business model, um, probably being the first thing that came to mind that was much more of a zig and a zag where we had to really iterate on something. There's a lot of smaller aspects of the overall company's story that are very iterative. But the big picture of what are we building and why and how's this thing going to be used? That was, um, you know, kind of a straight line that you could argue took seven, eight years to really get to uh, an adequate place of the original vision. The paper I wrote in um, college was titled The Feedback Tool, Measuring Intensity, Recovery, and Sleep. That was in 2011. You know, today still our three main metrics are strain, recovery, and sleep. So there was a certain perspective of this is this is what we need to create to be able to measure, to be able to give feedback, and, and that's how it's going to go. Um, the other thing about building hardware is it really is like a 12, 18-month, in some cases, two-year cycle. So you say, this is what we're building, and then two years later, you start to get real data on people wearing it and using it and interacting with it. So you have to be comfortable with this feeling of invention or looking around corners. Uh, You know, I think a lot of big tech companies have fallen victim to this idea that they can A-B test their way to success on everything. And if you look at really category defining products, they often have a strong perspective and they, they kind of have a perspective on the world and they're a little disruptive. And so... That, that, that I would say is my broad philosophy on, on product. In terms of how you create that, um, that level of innovation and conviction, there's a lot of different ways that you can go about it, and we certainly have. Um, there's been certainly the, the version of 100 drafts until we get it right. There's other been times where like, it's like it just you got it out of the gates, like boom, that's it. And you have to be open-minded enough to accept that you don't know necessarily where that magic's going to come from. And then you also have to try to find the confidence to go all in when you believe it, right? Because 
again, let's take hardware, for example. Okay, you've set this thing on a direction now. You can't change your mind halfway on that direction and pivot off. I mean, you can, but then you've just created a whole nother, two, you know, year long cycle. Right. So you have to, um, you have to really find, you have to be clear about the things you have strong conviction in. Love that. And love the fact that you've just sat down with us and had such a long, uh, thorough conversation. I feel like people will get a lot out of this, Will. Um, I think the last thing I want to ask you before we get out of here is just, like you were saying, big picture. Um, you needed to, a decade ago, have a vision of where you would wind up today in some capacity. Now you got this billion dollar company, you've seen some success, you've worked with some of the biggest athletes in the world. What is the next 10 years? What's the 2030 whoop? Um, without getting like too into trying to predict everything, right? Who knows what could happen? But just like when you speak of conviction, less about we're going to be selling this much or that, unless, you know, you might have a revenue goal. But I'm really wondering like what you want to accomplish for this world, you know, what you want your product to be able to contribute and maybe we always talk about the iPad or the iPod or whatever in these contexts of like this changed the way that people do things. And I get the sense that you're that type of thinker. And I wonder, you know, what your vision is for that when it comes to whoop. I mean, I believe whoop will unlock massive exhilarating health and potential for people around the world. And if you think about health monitoring five years ago versus where it'll be even in just a few years, I think it's going to be able to predict an enormous number of things about your, uh, your health. And if you look at the healthcare industry broadly, what's so screwed up about it is it's all curative costs. So something bad's happened, now let's fix it. And curative costs are really expensive. Whereas if you can identify something happened before it happens, uh, first of all, it's a lot uh, less expensive and it has the potential, of course, for a much better outcome, right? So we're talking about preventative care uh, or preventative costs versus curative costs. The potential for health monitoring is shifting an enormous number of cur curative costs to being preventative. And the craziest day of the year is your annual checkup with a doctor where you walk in off the street on some random day and they're taking a few vital signs as if that's the prophecy for the state of your body. And, you know, meanwhile, you could be measuring that 24 seven continuously. And rather than show up to the doctor's office on a random day of the year, you show up 30 minutes before something's about to happen. And so I think that's, that's kind of an obvious future of health monitoring. And, uh, and so, I, you know, I'm, I'm obviously very excited about, about getting to play a role in that. Well, I'm wishing you the best of luck. Thank you for joining the show and telling us about your life and your business and, you know, just, just keeping it super real, super honest. Loved it. Well, thank you, Ernest. Thanks for having me. That's a wrap on another episode of My Other Passion. I want to thank Will for coming out, telling us all about Whoop, that $3.6 billion valuation, and what it took to get to this point, you know, what it means to be an entrepreneur, his thoughts on fitness, health. I think we have a very interesting few years ahead of us in this space. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. We'll be back next Wednesday with yet another guest. But until then, I'm out.